So you've made a game and everything plays nicely, except the player has no way to save his progress. Well, fear not, in this video we'll have a look at saving game data locally and safely. But first, this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has server locations in over 90 different countries and is the fastest VPN provider out there. By using a VPN, you increase your security, anonymity, and it protects you from hackers. ExpressVPN even uses a strong 256-bit encryption to help protect all your data. For me, one of the biggest perks has been that it lets me stream The Office, which isn't available in my country. So thanks to ExpressVPN for allowing me to experience Dwight in HD. A membership is less than $7 a month and they even offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So check back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get 3 months free by clicking the link in the description. Now, whenever it comes to storing data in Unity, there are a few different ways to go about it. The quickest and easiest way is by using the built-in player prefs. With player prefs, we can easily store single variables one by one. I've already shown how you can use this to create a high score system, so if that's something you're interested in, definitely check out that video. However, it's not a great solution for saving player progress, since it's really only meant to handle very small amounts of data and it's not at all secure. Another way is using a simple file format like JSON or XML to store your data. The good thing about these formats is that they're designed to be super simple and easy to modify. In fact, you can just open them with a text editor and start changing stuff. This makes them perfect for making your game moddable or for creating simple databases during development to store stuff like items, abilities, and so on. They can even be uploaded to a web server and displayed in the browser. However, this strength is also their weakness. They're super easy to modify, which also makes them not at all secure and so not ideal for saving player progress. Luckily, there is a third option creating our own custom binary files. Custom binary files are very hard to read and modify because, well, they're in binary, which also makes them much more secure. And creating a binary file is actually fairly simple. Oh, and yes, this works on mobile as well. So we start by creating a class in Unity that contains the data we want as public variables. We could, for example, have a string, a float, a bool, and an int array. Keep in mind that data types specific to Unity like Vector3 or Color aren't serializable. This is not a big issue since these classes can often be represented using just the four base data types. A Vector3, for example, could just as well be stored in a float array with three elements. Now when we have the variables that we want to store, we mark the class as serializable. The next step is to use a binary formatter. The goal of the binary formatter is to read the data of any class we feed it and turn it into binary zeros and ones. We then create a new file on the system through code where the binary formatter can put this data. When we want to load the data back into our game, we simply open up the file, have the binary formatter convert back from binary and put it into the Unity class. So with that explanation, let's get started. So I've gone ahead and set up this simple example level. In here we have a player and this player has basically three primary pieces of data. The first one is his position and I've created a player movement script that is going to change this over time. He also has a player script containing a level and some health. And just to visualize this a bit more, I've created some UI here that has the level, the health and the position shown. The assets that I'm using for the UI is from the Ultimate Game UI pack. It's available on the Unity Asset Store. You can of course pick it up if you think it's cool, but it's not required in any way. And if we hit play, we can see that the position indeed does change over time. And we can use these buttons here to adjust the level and health. And as we do that, these things are going to update under our player. We can see the position and the level and health updating. So now that we know what data we're working with, let's try and create a class that will contain this data. So if we open up our player script, we can see that we have two variables in here. We have a public int for the level and one for the health. I also have a few methods in here, but these are just for updating the UI, so you can just ignore those. And of course, on top of these two variables, we also have a vector3 storing our position, but this is inside of the transform component. So let's go ahead and create a class that will store these three pieces of data. So inside of our assets, let's right click, go create, C sharp script, and let's call it player data and open it up in Visual Studio. So let's go ahead and remove the two methods. We can also delete the model behavior because this is not going to act as a component in our game. So now we have a completely empty class and we're ready to start populating it with some variables. The first one is pretty simple. It's a public int containing the level. Then we'll have another public int containing the health. And as for the position, you might want to go ahead and create a public vector3 containing the position. However, as we talked about, we aren't able to serialize stuff that is Unity specific, like a vector3. 
So instead, let's go ahead and create a float array that is going to store three elements, one for each coordinate in our position. So now we've defined our data, but we still need to tell the class how to get this from the player. So to do this, let's create a constructor for our class. If you've never worked with constructors before, they pretty much act as setup functions for our class. So let's create a public player data, and this is the syntax for creating a constructor. This is going to take in the data from our player, so it's going to take the player script, and let's just call it player. Now we can take the data from our player script and store it inside of these three variables. So we can go level equals player dot level, and that's probably the simplest case. We simply go to our player script and take the level variable and put it inside of our little variable in our data class. We can do the exact same thing for our health. We'll set health equal to player dot health. However, in the case of our position, we do need to convert a little bit. So here we can set our position equal to a new float array. And this is going to have three elements, one for the X, one for the Y, and one for the Z. And we can now go through and access each one of these elements. So we'll start with the X. So position index zero is going to be equal to player. We'll access the transform. So dot transform dot position dot X. And we can simply copy this line and paste it two more times. So we'll access the second coordinate, which is the Y, and the third coordinate, which is the Z. So let's change these to Y and Z. So you can see how really easily we can take these more advanced data types like a vector three and convert them to what they really are, basically just an array of floats. If you wanted to store a color, you could do the exact same thing. Have one element for the red, one for green, one for blue, and then maybe a fourth one for alpha. So now that we've created our player data class, we're ready to continue. But there's one very, very important thing that we need to remember to do first. And that is go to the top of this class and as an attribute, so inside of these two square brackets, mark it as system.serializable. And this just means that we will be able to save it in a file. So let's save this class now. Let's hit into Unity and let's create another C Sharp script. So right click, create C Sharp. And this one is going to be responsible for actually doing the saving. So let's call it something like save system. Let's double click to open it up in Visual Studio. Again, we're going to delete the two functions here and remove the mono behavior. And I actually want to go ahead and mark this class as static. A static class is just a class that can't be instantiated because we don't want to accidentally create multiple versions of our save system. Next up, we want to make sure that we include the appropriate namespaces. We can go ahead and remove system.collections. However, we do want to be using system.io. System.io is the namespace we use whenever we want to work with files on our operating system. So we'll use this when creating and opening the actual save file. Then we also need to be using system.runtime.serialization.formatters.binary. Yes, that is indeed a thing. If you have a hard time remembering this, don't worry, I do too. I almost always look it up. And as you might have guessed from the name of it, this will allow us to access the binary formatter. So let's go ahead and create a save function. Let's make it public, static, so we can call it from anywhere without an instance, void, and let's call it save player. The function is going to take in a player and let's call him player. Now, the first thing that we need to do is create a binary formatter for us to use. So we'll do binary formatter, let's call it formatter and set it equal to a new binary formatter. Next, we want to create a file to save to. But first, we probably want to decide where this file should be saved. So let's create a string called path and set it equal to, well, the location of a file. And you could go ahead and just input some kind of location on your system here. And the file would be saved to that location. However, the path that you want to use is probably going to completely depend on the operating system. A path that works on Windows probably doesn't work on Mac, and it's definitely not going to work on iOS or Android. And also, we probably don't want to make it too apparent where we're saving these files. We don't want it to be inside of the project folder or some obvious location. Luckily, Unity has a really handy function called application.persistentDataPath. And this is just going to get a path to a data directory on the operating system that isn't going to suddenly change. Then we can add anything to this. So we can create a subfile called player dot. And since we're actually making our own file here and it's just a binary file, we can use any file type that we want. That's right, it's completely up to you what you want to write. I'm going to write fun just to make this tutorial a bit more fun. And let's close it off. Now on a new line, we can create a new file. And each time we are working with a file, we use this concept of a file stream. 
A file stream is exactly what it sounds like. It's a stream of data contained in a file. And we can use a particular file stream to read and write from a file. So let's create a variable of type file stream. Let's call it stream and set it equal to a new file stream. Here we want to give it the path. And then we can define the file mode. And this is whether or not we want to open the file or create one, append to an already existing file or some other options. We're just going to do create. So now we've created this file on our system and we're ready to write to it. So let's go ahead and create some player data. Let's call it data and let's set it equal to a new player data. And because we created this handy constructor here, we can actually just go ahead and pass in our player and all this code is going to be run, which means that the player data class actually just sets up itself. So now that we have all the appropriate data formatted the way that it should be, we're ready to insert this into a file. So let's do formatter dot serialize, which means that we're going to write data to the file. First, this needs a file stream. We'll input our stream variable and then some data. In our case, our player data. Finally, when you're done writing data to the file, we want to close it off. So we'll go stream dot close. And that's all the code that we need for saving. Let's also create a variable for loading some data, public static. And here we don't want to input void. Since we're going to be loading some data, we probably want to return this data. So let's create a public static player data. Let's call it load player. And the first thing that we want to do in here is get a path similar to what we did up here. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this line for now. If you want to make it a bit cleaner, you can maybe separate this out from the two functions so that if you change it in one place, it's going to change in both. But for now, we'll just copy it. We're then going to check if a file exists in this path. So if file dot exists, we want to check for the path. Then we want to call some code. And if it does not, well, then we want to do some kind of error. Let's do debug dot log error. And we'll say save file not found in and then we'll output the path. Then we can just return null. However, if we do find a file, which hopefully we do, well, then we want to do actually a lot of the same stuff that we do up here when saving the player. First, we want to open up a binary formatter. So binary formatter, let's call it formatter equals a new binary formatter. Then we want to open up a file stream. So we want to go file stream stream equals new file stream. Again, we'll feed it the path, but this time we don't want to do file mode dot create. Instead, we want to do file mode dot open to open up the already existing save file. Then we can read from this stream by going formatter dot deserialize. So it's now going to change it from binary back to the old readable format. And the only thing that we need to feed it is the stream from a file. We can then store this data as with anything else in a variable. So let's create a player data variable that's called data and set it equal to the result. And it's going to give you a red line here. And that's because we need to cast this. We need to tell it what type of data we are working with. So we're going to format it as player data. So now we've cast this information into a player data type. And finally, we can go ahead and return the data. Of course, there's one very important thing that we forgot. And that is we always need to close the file stream. So here we want to go stream dot close. Otherwise, you're going to get some weird looking errors. And that is actually everything that we need to do for our save system, which means that we're pretty much ready to try this out. If we save this now and go into Unity to make sure that we don't have any errors, we actually have all the components needed to now save and load this data. The only thing that's left to decide is when to trigger this behavior. And that's completely up to you. You can save at the end of a level. You can save every 10 seconds. You can save when the user exits the game, or you can save using buttons. And I've gone ahead and created two buttons here, a save button and a load button. So let's just trigger some code based on these buttons. If you want to be really proper about this, you can do it in some kind of game manager. I'm just going to do it inside of the player script. So here I'm going to create two public functions so that we can call them from the buttons. One is going to be public void save player. And here all we need to do is go save system. And because this is a static class and function, we can go dot save player. And that's all we need. Then we can feed it in the player that we want to save. In our case, this player. So we can just write this. And let's also create a public void load player. Again, we access the save system and we do load player. And of course, this outputs a player data. So we want to take that data and put it back into our player. Let's create a player data variable. Let's call it data. 
and set it equal to what we get when loading. And then we can go level equals data dot level, health equals data dot health. And for the position, let's create a vector three called position. And let's set position dot x equal to data dot position. And then we'll take the first element and let's actually copy this a few times. So the second one is going to be y, the third one is going to be z, and it's going to go from zero to one to two. And then finally, let's set transform dot position equal to this position variable. So now we've loaded back in our player data. And if we save this and go to Unity, we can now find the save and load buttons. So I'm gonna select my save button here. I'm gonna go add an on click event. And this is referencing an object. I'm gonna drag in the player. And let's go under the player function and call the save player method. And let's do the same thing for loading. So load button, add an event. It's gonna access the player object, find the player script and call the load player function. So now we should see that if we play and go ahead and mix around our level and health here. So let's see, we've increased to level seven. Our health has gone down to 28. And you can take note of our current position here. Let's save. And if our game then changes, let's say we go up a few levels, um, let's say to nine, our health goes up again to 40 or 42. And this is our new position. And we then hit load everything snaps right back. And the cool thing is that this will even persist between game sessions. So if we close down the game or change this around and then stop playing, go back in and hit play again, and we then hit load, it's going to snap right back to these values. And if we wanna override our save, well then we simply hit save again. So if we want to now have these values, we can hit save, let's stop playing, hit play again, hit load, and voila, everything's gonna to update to the new values. Yay! So that's pretty much it for this video. Now you can quickly see that it might become pretty slow and cumbersome to work with these files as the project gets bigger. For each part of your game, you need to create a save load function and a data class to convert from gameplay data to data that can be stored. And while these files are hard to edit, it can be done. So if you're looking for a more long-term solution, I really recommend picking up an asset like EasySave. It's just going to save you so much time and hassle. It allows you to save Unity specific data. It can handle a bunch of data at once, it can encrypt the data to make it really secure, and you can even use it to save and load from the web. I've used it before and really recommend it. If you want to check it out, there's of course a link in the description. Also make sure to check out ExpressVPN, simply click the link in the description to find out how you can get 3 months for free. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. <laughs> Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in October, and a special thanks to Andrew Kalinenko, Art Armin, True VR Systems, Simmer IO, Alexander Blair, Cheetah 3D, Jeff Johnson, Infinity PBR, Cyborg Mummy, Dennis Sullivan, Chris, Sheriff Abdullah, Faisal Marify, Thanks to Long, Leo Lasset, Vincent Van Skewer, Swears D, Derek Kimskirk, Ronan, Tima Polderbach, Bruins Cat, Naoki Uwasaki, Gregory Pierce, Larry Tweed, James Rogers, Rob Farron, Pakum Bernia, Erasmus, Robert Bund, Corey Jackson, James P, Anthony Patton, Kyo Swedeski, and Abrisi. You guys rock.